Hi everyone, I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. I'm thrilled to be here today and we have an amazing program on a really hot topic, hydrogen and also CCUS by Dr. Franek Hashuk from Kansas University and really thrilled and um, well, welcome. Well, thank you, Susan. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm uh, really honored to see all the folks that have showed up here today, um, at least here in Kansas. It's a bright, sunny day, and we look like we're finally uh, sort of in that fall, nice weather um, time as we transition toward, of course, the the wonderfulness of a Midwestern winter. Um, but yeah, today, uh, I also want to appreciate Susan's invitation to talk to you today about hydrogen and carbon management in the mid-continent. Um, as we've probably all noticed, there's quite a transition happening in our industry toward uh, new ways of thinking and new ways of doing business. Um, and really what we're gonna talk about today is just that next step in our industry's evolution. Um, I think our industry more than a lot of others has, had, has been characterized by rapid change over short periods of time to new ways of business as you know, back in the late 1800s, as new fields came online and new refining technologies um, were developed, we saw rapid changes in, in basic things of how we transported oil, how we drilled for oil, how we sold oil, and, and what that oil was used for. And I think what we're seeing today is, again, just that next evolution. And, and while we might um, at times think that change is scary, we can also remember that change can be exciting and change can can bring new ideas and new people and new perspectives into our industry that really is what's necessary for it to uh, be a going concern long time for uh, a long times into the future, right? This, this, this whole hydrocarbon industry as we know it has been going for about 175 years. You know, it's our duty to do what we can to um, move that forward and keep producing those products that that our society uh, finds so useful and so um, valuable to its livelihood. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and we'll get into the slides today. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm gonna, I might even recline here a little bit. You know, sometimes it's nice to, to relax while you're giving a your presentation. And one of the benefits of Zoom is you don't always have to be up on a stage behind a lectern. You can, you can be in a rather comfortable chair while you're talking to people. So again, my name is Frana Kashuk, and, and I'm here at the Kansas Geological Survey, which, as we say, is a research and service unit of the University of Kansas. Um, we've been doing public service uh, and research for since, I think, 1889, somewhere in the 1880s. Um, when you go that far back, you know, it's all good among friends. Um, but we really strive on doing that sort of research that is that is both useful and interesting to the public, to policymakers, to industry, and to um, academic researchers. So we'll slip ahead here. My summary here, again, is that our current energy transition involves rethinking our relationship with our work, right? We can talk about all the technologies that we're doing, but, but really that transition happen, has to happen inside each one of us. We have to recognize that we need to up our skills, get new skills, um, get better at the skills that we had. Um, but fundamentally, everything I'm going to talk about today is subsurface science and engineering, and that's our bread and butter. We are good at that. We just have to learn sort of a new application for that, uh, those skills that we already have, and, and of course, polish up the skills that we might need as we apply ourselves to new types of rocks in new basins and in new um, regulatory regimes and political environments. Um, the two big technologies we'll talk about today are carbon capture use and storage and the hydrogen economy. Um, and these will be integral uh, parts of our industry going forward, as far as I can tell, and what I've seen over the last five to 10 years. And again, change is a natural, change is part of the natural evolution of any industry. And our industry is not immune to that, that um, you know, fundamental process. And so we shouldn't panic. We shouldn't we shouldn't denigrate these new things. We shouldn't say, oh, that'll never work. Um, because usually folks that bet against change lose. And it's the ones that can recognize change and 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 take advantage of that change are the ones that that prosper going forward and become new sources of um, ideas and wealth generation going forward. 
Okay. No, oh, here we go. So one thing I want you to think about today is that as an industry, we have long since been focused on hydrocarbons. And if we break that word down, it is the two words, hydrogen and carbon. These two things that characterize that material that we have sought out of the earth for so long. Um, this talk is gonna be about thinking about that hydrogen and about that carbon as separate entities and how we can use those separate entities to um, both reduce the environmental impact of our industry as well as uh, generate a new um, market for um, new energy services and new um, industrial feedstocks for the next generation of manufacturing and um, product development and energy use. All right, so again, I've talked about the current energy transition. I like to throw this slide up every time I talk about it so we can think about those four basic pillars of our current energy transition. First one is carbon capture and storage. This gets CO2 out of the atmosphere and it prolongs our investments in current power plants. Um, we can talk about energy storage, which manages the variable production of power from renewable sources and from fossil generators. Um, what we don't hear about a lot is a lot of our fossil fueled power plants are actually variably producing power. They get turned on and off um, as the grid wants that power. And by integrating large scale energy storage, often in the form of hydrogen storage or compressed air storage, we can stabilize our grid and provide more resiliency for when our variable power production assets can't be producing power. The hydrogen economy is something that we'll talk a lot about today, and this is exciting because hydrogen can be burned along with our natural gas infrastructure today, can be used as a transport fuel and heavy transport um, uses like trucking and shipping and trains. Uh, and then it has a lot of industrial uses in terms of uh, being an industrial feedstock. Finally, we have this idea of critical minerals, and these are required for um, high-end manufacturing uh, things like solar panels, wind turbines, electronics, and screens, as well as being required for some of our defense technologies. Um, they aren't necessarily very rare in the Earth's crust, but they're often very complex to refine out of natural sources. And what we're seeing is a, is a real push um, in numerous countries to um, clarify those supply chains and diversify those supply chains for these so-called critical minerals. Um, Often that is being driven more by a national security, national defense um, impetus, whereas these other three are really about combating climate change, um, and turning our in, reducing the carbon footprint of our sort of global industry. Um, but really, again, the way I like to think about the current energy transition is about people. And so Will Jim be able to still go and describe core in an unair conditioned warehouse in the Middle East like he loves to do? Um, will our um, hierarchies of doing business remain where we can have three managers for every one technical person doing actual work? Um, will Alex be able to use his excellent skills at finding um, white sand dunes that he's honed over a career? Um, will Sean be able to come and talk to you about those TPS reports um, like he so enjoys? And finally, will students want to join this new industry as it's rapidly changing? Are we able to show that next generation that that there is, you know, a stable, uh, a stable enough industry that they can make that bet, that investment of their most critical asset, which is their future, um, into working with this with this community of subsurface scientists and engineers. And I think that's really exciting is, is making sure that we can all be a part of this and grow together uh, toward this new energy world. All right, now it's also important to recognize again that our energy uh, portfolio and our energy types, our energy diversity have changed over time and they will likely continue to change. And again, our energy transition that we're going through here should not be viewed as something that is strange, new, unprecedented, uh, or weird. It's just the next step in our evolution. Um, this is a really fun figure I like to show from the ExxonMobil Energy Outlook in 2009, showing how the mix of energy sources has changed over time um, in our economy. 
uh, at least in the United States. And we can see we used to be a predominantly wood-based economy, then we became a coal-based economy, and then starting in the middle of the 20th century, we really transitioned to hydrocarbons, oil and gas. And we can see nuclear coming in there, uh, uh, renewables and hydro as well. And, and we can, one of the safest bets I think we can make is that as time goes forward, our sources of energy will become more diverse as again, we need to meet increased energy demands from our global population. Um, and we can also remember that there are times in our past where we thought we could never solve a large intractable problem. Around 1900, New York City was drowning in manure from all the horses that were pulling all the wagons and the carriages that moved people and goods around the city. Um, there's this truly, I'm glad this picture isn't any sharper because I don't think I'd want to see any of the details in this photograph. Um, but it was written about in the New York Times, how will we ever solve this massive environmental problem? And the way we solve that problem, or at least the way New York City did and many cities, is that transitioning to a new technology, a new way of using energy that allowed them to solve a previous problem. Um, uh, and that change came about in about 20 years, where we went from a completely horse-based transportation system to a completely um, internal combustion engine-based transportation system, as well as things like electrified trolleys and, and a subway. Um, and so again, let's remember that as, as novel as this energy transition is we're going through today, it's nothing new. It's what we as humans have had to deal with over our entire history. All right. Um, yeah, there we are. That's what it looks like today. Maybe not the same street, but the same sort of vantage point. Um, all right. So talking about carbon dioxide, it's always nice to just get us back to basics so we're all on the same page. One carbon, two oxygens. It can be emitted naturally. It can be consumed naturally. And it can be emitted by humans, uh, mainly through combustion and burning of uh, some sort of carbon-containing compound. In the past, that was wood, but in the last 200 years, we've really seen, um, as a global society, we have moved toward fossil sources of this energy and of this uh, industrial feedstock for our, um, for our economy and for our livelihoods. Now, the way we can combat uh, the negative repercussions of burning and of CO2 um, emissions into the atmosphere, um, it's it's been shown quite clearly that CO2 in the atmosphere causes global warming, and we're seeing effects um, of that increased CO2 concentration in our, in our atmosphere um, year over year. But basically, we take the system that we have for producing hydrocarbons out of the subsurface, producing oil and gas, and we reverse it. We go to that place where the CO2 is being generated through, say, combustion, Maybe it's a power plant, maybe it's a refinery, maybe it's a cement plant um, or a gas processing plant. We capture that CO2 and then we send it back to some sort of some sort of injection point where we can inject that carbon dioxide back into the subsurface. Usually we envision this as injecting not a gas, a CO2 gas, but as a supercritical liquid so that it occupies, uh, so that the CO2 is much denser and we can get more CO2 per unit of rock volume in the subsurface. And so typically that means we need to inject that CO2 over 3,000 feet down in the subsurface so that our pressures are high enough to keep that CO2 in its supercritical liquid-like state um, down there. Um, and again, we can capture CO2 from a number of sources. One of the downsides is that this can be a very expensive technology in some cases, it can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to a billion dollars to retrofit um, an existing facility with a capture system. Um, and one plant or one refinery may have multiple sources or multiple emissions points, um, and each would need its own capture system. Um, that doesn't mean it's impossible, but that means um, when these facilities perhaps are being designed in the future, they, they may be taking that into account and trying to design their facilities with more of a carbon capture um, mindset from the initial design stage. Uh, but again, these are facilities you may have near you. And these uh, many of these facilities now with um, tax credits that we have in the Internal Revenue Code are looking toward how they can inject their CO2 to take advantage of those tax credits. 
Um, here's a map of all the major CO2 sources in the United States, color coded by different um, uh, by different facilities. We have ammonia plants, ethanol plants, hydrogen producers, and natural gas processing uh, facilities. Uh, but we can see here also uh, natural the natural gas pipe or the CO2 pipelines that exist out there in um, in in service already today. And so again, in terms of you know, CO2 infrastructure, we have some existing already today. Uh, and, and those can be models for how both we design our new facilities and how we understand the risks of operating CO2 infrastructure going forward. Because again, with anything new, there's going to be questions about risk. And, and it's important as an industry that we talk about that risk um, in a uh, mature and accurate way to the stakeholders with which we need to interact. Um, one of the things about us here in the upper Midwest is you see all these green dots on here and those represent ethanol plants that are taking um, agricultural products and turning them into um, a liquid fuel. And those are very high purity CO2 sources. There tends to just be one source per plant or one emission point per plant. And so these facilities are seen as some of the lower hanging fruit for carbon capture um, the, the crux of the problem that we have, though, in the upper Midwest is we ha generally have a pretty thin sedimentary cover, and it's hard for us to get down to that 3,000 foot um, uh, uh, depth where we would want to inject that carbon. Okay. Another way we can capture carbon is directly from the air, and these are called DAC systems. Um, these can be, these are nice because they can be located directly at a storage site, and so you don't need a pipeline. Um, you can sort of you can sort of build them in place, and these push um, you know atmospheric air through a chemical treatment system that pulls the CO2 out of that out of that air. Um, and currently, these operate best in in hot locations. Okay, uh, we can use CO2. So once we capture it, we can do stuff with it. We can put it into beverages. We can use it for dry cleaning. If you ever see green dry cleaners, they're usually using a liquid CO2 to clean your clothes. Um, you can make concrete stronger by bathing it in CO2 as it cures. Um, and we can do uh, advanced indoor agriculture by creating environments of higher CO2, which encourages plant growth. Um, in industrial processes, CO2 can be turned into other chemicals, especially if you have a source of hydrogen around that can, that can upgrade that CO2. Uh, and then finally, we can take our CO2 and inject it into old oil fields to encourage production of um, new hydrocarbons. Now that is somewhat controversial because um, you are using the CO2 to produce more um, fuels, which will then themselves produce CO2, but at least that produced hydrocarbon has a lower carbon intensity than if you were producing hydrocarbons um, with no CO2 being injected back into the reservoir. And so again, we can think of baby steps or the slow evolution of an industry rather than turning off one industry and turning on another one, which can be um, quite hazardous to folks' livelihood. All right. Um, we can also take our CO2 and um, sequester it in deep saltwater aquifers, whether those are onshore or offshore. Uh, these would be places where we don't intend to produce any oil or gas from that, from that subsurface aquifer, that subsurface layer. Um, this water is generally too salty to drink, so it wouldn't have any other use. Um, the, some of the benefits of this system is that we would penetrate, there are fewer existing wells that penetrate the cap rock than say in an oil and gas field. Um, though, and they are more widely dispersed across the surface of the United States, at least, than where we can find uh, oil and gas fields. We can also store our CO2 in basalt. And this is a really interesting um, case that we may be able to take advantage of here in uh, the Midwest um, and in the mid-continent. And so one thing that happens is if we inject this supercritical CO2 into a basalt formation, or currently doing this in Iceland, that CO2 scavenges calcium out of the uh, basalt itself and then mineralizes into a solid um, carbon-rich mineral, in most cases limestone or some uh, weird boutique carbonate mineral. 
um, if you get into it, the, the precipitation kinetics of this stuff is pretty fast. And, and they found a, a Department of Energy study in um, Washington State, the Wallula Project, found that they mineralized a, a, a large proportion of the CO2 injected. I think it was over 50% uh, in something like 18 months. And so uh, this can be really, really fantastic if, if you have a community that's worried about leakage or if, or if your uh, project itself is worried about leakage. In this case, the CO2 turns into a mineral and its leakage potential becomes almost negligible because again, it's turned into that solid phase, um, which is again, much harder to leak back to the surface. Um, here in the Midwest, here's a map of where we can potentially store CO2 and basalts across the United States. Um, the green colors here would be um, basalt or other mafic rocks that, that exist. Um, the, the orange colors are ultra mafic rocks, which have their own properties that are favorable for um, injecting uh, CO2 into and, and having enhanced reaction rates. Uh, with that CO2, but you can see there's sort of a, uh, a lazy green um, uh, blob that runs from Lake Superior down through Minnesota and Iowa into Nebraska and down into Kansas, and this is one leg of the, the mid-continent rift. And this rift is really special because it has such a huge volume of basalt, and this basalt, while being about a billion years old, is still a possible place that we could um, inject carbon dioxide into, and in, and in fact, under some of those ethanol plants that we saw on one of the previous maps. Um, oh, great. Alex is in the meeting room. He missed his photograph, but he is joining us today. All right, everyone. Um, so as, as I mentioned briefly before, storage has risks. And storing CO2, that liquid CO2, um, the two major risks to think about would be leaks. So that's where we have CO2 that's um, leaving our storage re reservoir, either through um, an, a, a legacy well that was not properly sealed before the injection scheme started, maybe because no one knew it was there, um, or maybe there were uh, unknown fractures through the ceiling horizon that allowed that CO2 to leak out and into a shallower um, horizon or even to the surface. Uh, to date, there haven't been, um, as far as I'm aware, large um, leaks from underground CO2 injection projects that get to the surface as sort of a dramatic gaseous leak. It's more of slow leak. If there are, is leakage, it's more of a slow leakage that gets into shallower horizons above the seal, but not necessarily coming out at the surface as something um, that, again, might be very dramatic. Now, what we can see with a lot of underground injections, whether it's injecting salt water or injecting CO2, is that we're changing the stress state in the subsurface. And that change in pressure can cause changes in, um, in fault behavior that can lead to seismicity. Uh, in many cases, that seismicity is too small to be felt. In some cases, that seismicity can rise to the level of being felt. Um, um, that... Uh, how was I going to say that? That seismicity, again, is something that is, if it is felt, it is something that um, that engenders a lot of concern in the general public and thus in policymakers and regulators in trying to minimize that sort of uh, activity going forward. Um, in general, the public, uh, no matter if you tell them, oh, it's only a magnitude one or a magnitude two, you, you, you wouldn't even feel this. Um, any earthquake is too much earthquake. Um, you know, one one way I've thought about talking about this is that recently they measured the ground shaking from a Taylor Swift concert, and that was a magnitude 2.8, right? No one complained about that, but often there will be complaints about seismicity that is felt that is less than that. But again, that's, again, unexpected. It's something that that is being caused by something else that's happening. And, and Again, we have to be mature in how we communicate these risks and how we explain um, some of the side effects of the activities that we might be bringing into a community that they haven't experienced before. Um, in Kansas, here at the Kansas Geological Survey, um, we have executed CCUS research for over 25 years, and we've um, a lot of that is summarized on this map here, which we sort of call our CCUS or carbon capture play map where we show the location of our coal-fired power plants, our major chemical plants and refineries, 
and then our ethanol facilities, um, as well as locating you know, where we have done reservoir assessments uh, and reservoir modeling for CCUS injection into the subsurface. Um, a lot of the most favorable stratigraphy is in that southwestern quarter of the state, um, where the stratigraphy is, again, deep enough to support supercritical CO2 injection. The water is salty enough that the Environmental Protection Agency will allow you to inject CO2 into that for formation or that horizon. Um, and, and really, we see that, that there is a lot of potential and a lot of storage space down there in the subsurface for putting CO2. Um, one of the um, one of the things, though, of course, is that you can see that our sources of CO2 are predominantly outside of that blue box. And so getting the CO2 from where it is to where we could inject it uh, in the subsurface is one of the major um, one of the major uh, complications that almost any CCUS project has to um, has to solve. How do you transport the CO2 from the source? to uh, a storage location. Because um, most of these facilities were not built with CO2 storage in mind. That's why they don't have CO2 um, capture equipment built onto them. You know, they, didn't, they didn't say, oh, well, let's put this right over a great reservoir. Uh, they said, let's put this where we can get um, both our, our raw materials to the plant and our products away from the plant um, with maximum transportation efficiency. And so, um, Again, we will see as time goes on the evolution of new transportation networks to move CO2 around, or maybe even siting facilities in places uh, that are conducive to carbon storage. This may be a new line of work for some of us, is to uh, consult with uh, major CO2 producers on, say, where they want to build a new facility, or with their existing facilities, where they can get CO2 from that facility to a prospective underground horizon. Um, this is just a, a slide I like to show of all the projects that we've done. We're currently on our 10th, 10th major CCUS project here at KGS. And, and these projects have included a wide variety of um, partners um, from across the, the landscape of academic institutions, small, medium, and large oil companies, um, uh, consultancies, service companies, um, who else do we have here? We've got universities from this country and others. Um, we've got scientific societies. We've got non-governmental organizations. Um, and we've got, uh, yeah, even public accountants and lawyers involved in this. So it, it's a pretty exciting um, space. And it's, and it's a space that we should all recognize that exists and, and it, is an, it is a going concern. And this is a place where we can um, derive uh, both um, lively careers and, and professional advancements. This is a new network that is growing out of the networks that we already had. And so it's important to reach out and, and recognize that the skills that you have can be applied at all these different types of companies to understand this new carbon capture world. Um, I also wanna recognize, as I said, this is, uh, here at KGS, we've done 20 or 25 years of CCUS research. I've only been here for the last five. Um, there are numerous people here at KGS that have contributed both to initiating this CCUS research program, but then perpetuating it through time. Some of those are still at KGS. Some of those have moved on to other, other places. And, and it's important to recognize all those folks and their contributions. You'll see their names on a lot of the reports from those previous studies that we executed. All right, talked about pipelines. Um, pipelines, again, are the cheapest way to move liquids across the surface of the earth if you don't have access to ocean-going vessels or, or shipping on um, navigable rivers. Um, and so there's a, there is a, uh, uh, an economic calculation and engineering calculation of how we pick the routes for these things that minimize costs and maximizes uh, access to both sources of CO2 and sinks for CO2. Um, uh, we've seen controversy publicly about new pipelines for things like um, traditional hydrocarbons. We've seen controversy, especially if you've been following the news in Iowa about the CO2 pipelines that are being planned up there. Um, but again, these are all 
this is sort of the natural cost of doing business of how we move forward in building a new economic and engineering system for the CCUS world. All right, so just we're going to break here and do a little audience participation. I want you to write in the chat. There we go. Different ways that you think we can store energy. Um, and so I've got the chat open and, and let's see who can type in a way to store energy. It can be very broad. It can be very specific. Gravity, we've got injection. What are some other words we've got here? We can put it in the subsurface. Good one, Serge, nice to see ya. Alex says batteries. Yvonne says in fractures, other ways to store energy. Um, rubber bands, flywheels. Okay, rubber bands, hadn't thought about that one. Hydro, dispatchable hydro, I like it. Suzanne is drawing on the screen, this is great. We can store heat in wells, exclamation point. I agree, John. Um, we can do it geothermal. Um, Injection in materials that has carbon stored in it, like organic waste. Yes, excellent, Yanesh. You can put it in salt caverns. I like it, Melinda. So these are a lot of different ideas about how we can store energy and storing energy as we sort of shift our idea here. Ryan says compressed air. Of course, the Iowans are gonna talk about compressed air. Um, uh, as we move forward through this energy transition, one of the big things we wanna do is we wanna take we want to recognize the variability of some of our really renewable energy sources like wind and solar and take that variability and sort of smooth it out a little bit so we can have power when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. Um, here's the plot I like to show that shows some of the, the scale of our different energy storage systems as well, uh, both in terms of how much energy they can score, store and over what time periods they can store it. And so we can see things down here that store energy and can dispatch it on the scale of seconds, like flywheels and capacitors. Someone mentioned flywheels, so great job. Batteries, those are more on the scale of minutes to hours. Um, but when we get into this realm of large scale energy storage, these are geologic storage systems. The, all of these, hydrogen, compressed air storage, and pumped hydro, these all are geologically based. And so as subsurface scientists or even scientists that work predominantly at the surface, that is our um, that is our wheelhouse. And we should think about this as being a realm where geoscientists and geoengineers uh, should be at the, at least have a seat at the table, if not at the head of the table of understanding how we design and operate these systems for the benefit of our, of our um, industry and, and our not industry, but our um, society. There we go. Um, um, all right. So we're going to, uh, just a second here. We're going to go on to the next slide. So um, someone mentioned salt caverns. So this is a map that I, that I made for a project we were doing looking at storing energy in salt caverns, specifically storing hydrogen in salt caverns. Um, the red blotches here, or the blobs, are places where we have significant salt deposits in the United States. And these are all places uh, that we will probably see the development of significant underground storage of hydrogen over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, these locations have salt that is thick enough that, that um, energy storage through hydrogen could be, could be implemented in these locations. Um, we're already seeing in Southwestern Utah, uh, a large cavern being built to store um, to store renewable energy for uh, the California market. As you can see, that's some of the closest salt to the California market. Um, on the Gulf Coast, we already have caverns that store hydrogen. Those are more to um, manage hydrogen on a distribution system for various refineries and chemical plants. Um, but again, this salt is one of the sort of fundamental geologic determiners on where we can do large scale. Um, hydrogen storage. As time goes on, research is being undertaken currently to look at whether we can, or the best ways to deploy hydrogen storage into aquifers. We do a lot of natural gas storage in aquifers these days, um, but um, it hasn't really been attempted with hydrogen. Uh, but that would even open up more of the surface of the United States, for example, to storing storing that energy. In the background, the dots you see on here are the coal-fired power plants and the natural gas-fired power plants. Um, and so all of these facilities could use uh, energy storage to better manage their, um, their 
their power economics. Because even today, a lot of times our our fossil fuel po powered power plants um, are being asked to turn on and off to to meet specific uh, demand conditions on the grid. And that's not how they're necessarily designed and that's not how they operate most efficiently. And so this again can bring more efficiency to our system and more longevity to our investments in the current power grid, which keeps power prices down. Um, while we talk about energy storage, we should also remember that we store energy in different ways uh, instead of just as say hydrogen. Um, we have something called the Strategic Petroleum Reserve on the Gulf Coast where the federal government purchased salt caverns in the 70s and has used solution mining to produce a total of about 60 caverns, um, where we store about 714 million barrels of oil. And if you've been following the news, this has actually been um, somewhat of a, a political hot potato and, and something that has been talked about a lot over the last two years, as the federal government has used our petroleum reserve to help bring down some of the um, uh, gas prices here in the United States that were caused sort of by the disruptions in the oil industry around uh, the COVID pandemic lockdowns. Uh, and even as recently as August, you know, there's news here on the PBS NewsHour about, um, you know, plans to restock the nation's emergency oil reserve. Um, but again, this is, this is a form of energy storage where we're storing energy in the form of crude oil uh, in salt caverns in the subsurface. Um, in the United States, we have uh, salt cavern gas storage. So we store natural gas in salt caverns as well. In the states in green, uh, we have the number of caverns in each state where we store gas. Um, we store liquid hydrocarbons. So that could be crude oil, that could be refined uh, things like gasoline or propane or butane in salt caverns in the states with the red star. And we can also think of storing nuclear waste or, or, or nuclear adjacent uh, wastes in in salt as a form of energy storage. We're storing that material down in a salt bed um, as the consequence of an energy system that we have. And so down at the WIP site in New Mexico is where we you know have our low level nuclear waste repository. Um, uh, more broadly, in other countries, there's a lot of um, salt cavern gas storage as well in Europe. Um, this. This uh, salt cavern gas storage, as well as aquifer gas storage, again, was a, a very pressing um, story over the last couple of years as um, the invasion of Ukraine has altered the European gas market. Um, with the reduction in supply from Russia, uh, all of a sudden, this idea of storing natural gas so that it can be used at a greater rate than it can be brought in, say, by LNG tankers um, or by domestic production. Um, and and really that that gas storage allowed uh, the economy of Europe to survive the last winter as well as it being a generally warmer, warmer winter without a lot of the um, doom and gloom that had been predicted initially when when Russia invaded Ukraine. Here in Kansas, we are one of the leaders in the country in terms of salt cavern storage. We have about 368 active wells, and by wells, that would be an individual salt cavern, storing about 73 million barrels of liquefied products. Uh, and then there are 227 inactive wells that are monitoring wells that are being used to, to again, monitor um, caverns that are offline. Um, but these are spread across central Kansas in our Permian salt deposits. These tend to be a lot smaller than the ones on the Gulf Coast, which on, are on the order of 2,500 feet tall. Um, caverns we have here in Kansas are only about um, 100 to 200 feet tall. But, you know, one factoid here is that while we don't have the biggest caverns, we have the most. And so we have about half of the salt caverns um, in the United States. And so that has resulted in a, in a, in a large um, you know, workforce that is skilled in both um, designing, building, operating, maintaining, and regulating, and shutting down these caverns. And that's that's going to be a key factor going forward in determining where these systems can be brought online, is where are the people? Um, again, uh, one of, hopefully you'll get this thread through my whole presentation, is that it's about the people. Um, um, it's about the folks in the industry that do the work and come up with the good ideas because we still haven't gotten to the point where AI and machine learning can do all this stuff. 
Um, uh, folks talked about compressed air in the chat as we started. This is another way we can store energy in terms of uh, taking that excess energy and storing it as an air bubble underground. There have been studies in Iowa and elsewhere in the Midwest where we've looked at, at the possibility of storing air, uh, storing energy as compressed air. Um, but generally, we need higher power prices to, to justify these sorts of investments. Um, there's two systems online in the world right now, one in Germany and one in Alabama. The Alabama plant is actually studying changing one of their caverns over to a hydrogen storage cavern. But again, these are used to balance power from times when it's uh, less economic to sell it to the grid to times when it's more economic. But they've been operating for 30, 40 years, so it's been uh, uh, quite a long time. Um, we had some folks mention pumped hydro. This is another place where even if we're subsurface scientists, we can operate up at the surface of the earth. But again, we can we can take uh, power at times when it's not economic, use it to pump water uphill. And then when we want that power back, we let the water flow back downhill. Um, and these are these are fairly simple systems that operate more like a hydropower plant. Um, but they do take up a lot of space at the surface of the earth. And you have to be concerned about um, you know, folks recreating in the reservoirs and, and, and what impacts that might have on the system that you're running. All right, now hydrogen, uh, we'll be getting into hydrogen now. You may have heard of different colors of hydrogen. It's basically based on what, um, what you use to make that hydrogen. You can use coal to make the hydrogen. It's called black hydrogen. You can use um, hydrocarbons to make hydrogen. If you capture those emissions, it's called blue hydrogen. If you're using taking uh, renewable e electricity to split water through electrolysis, we call that green hydrogen. Um, the other one, important one to think about is pink hydrogen. And that's where we take nuclear power, again, to do, use to do electrolysis of water and create hydrogen. Um, this is a figure from um, uh, that I got from the Carbon Realization Research Council by way, I think, of the DOE, uh, talking about hydrogen production. And really, we see hydrogen as being that energy medium and that industrial feedstock that uh, our oil and gas industry evolves towards in the next 10, 20, 30 years, where we see that being the material that we move around to support all sorts of different industrial processes, transportation processes, um, and energy storage, uh, depending on where we are sourcing that energy from. Um, we have a lot of different technologies to store hydrogen, but basically if we want to do it at grid scale, we need to do it underground in a large subsurface formation, either in the porosity of that formation, uh, like an aquifer, or in a salt cavern that we've built specifically for the purpose. Um, currently, uh, there are salt caverns on the Gulf Coast. Uh, Lindy, which is a which industrial gas company, runs a hydrogen pipeline system that serves a number of industrial customers uh, in Louisiana and the Houston area. Um, and this is operated for, for several years um, and uh, includes both, uh, again, cavern storage systems and the pipelines that are associated with that. So again, down there, we have that industrial infrastructure and that workforce that knows how to operate this sort of facility safely over a long period of time. Um, and we have the regulators that know how to keep track of that system and, and ensure that it's, it's meeting its obligations to the communities through which it operates. Um, again, here in Kansas and in Oklahoma, we have a large salt deposit uh, and we have a lot of both renewable and fossil power plants um, and refineries that can take advantage of that salt for storing hydrogen in salt caverns. Um, and we'll likely see development in that arena uh, over the next 10 to 20 years as, uh, as industrial users see the value of having that, that secure underground storage for that industrial gas hydrogen. Um, here at KGS, we executed a study last that finished up last year where we looked at what it would take to um, store energy from a natural gas-powered power plant um, uh, in one cavern underneath that power plant. And we saw that, that even including things like matching um, our production capacity to the market, the cost of the construction of the cavern, um, we found that it would cost about $1.75 per kilogram of hydrogen to produce 
um, building this system out just for that one power plant. And that's really close to the Department of Energy's goal of, of $1 per kilogram. Um, we're seeing a lot of new activity in uh, the federal government in terms of funding opportunities for new hydrogen uh, research in the subsurface. These opportunities can be available both to academic researchers and industrial researchers who want to um, develop these systems. One example, there's a funding opportunity out right now from um, the Advanced Research Projects uh, for Energy part of the Department of Energy, and this is looking at stimulating hydrogen production in subsurface uh, formations um, through enhanced serpentinization, um, as well as uh, being able to fund projects that look at subsurface engineering for the management of hydrogen reservoirs. And the type of money you can get here is one to two and a half million over 24 months. And, and if you're interested in this, you better get writing because the deadline's coming up. Um, you may have heard of the hydrogen hubs competition that's been going on for the last year to 18 months. Uh, there's a, it's down, it seems, to about 10 hubs, and, and uh, those hubs seem to be on, on track to get about $7 billion in federal government funding to start, produce, to start putting steel in the ground to build the infrastructure for this hydrogen economy. Um, if you haven't heard about it in your area, here's a map showing all the states that were involved in various hydrocarbon hub efforts. So it's basically every state has at least one hub that had been announced for that state, unless you're in New Hampshire, South Dakota, Idaho, or Florida. Um, and I'm not sure about Hawaii or Alaska, but um, basically, you know, hubs were proposed for a vast uh, percentage of the footprint of the continental United States, at least. And so um, we can imagine if there's 10 being funded, you're going to there may be one of these hubs in your neighborhood and they may need a geologist or a geological engineer or a petroleum engineer to help them understand what's going on in their subsurface. Um, Bill Gates thinks it's a good idea to be looking for hydrogen. Um, he's actually been bankrolling, um, drilling for naturally occurring hydrogen here in Kansas in the mid-continent rift. Um, and you know when old money gets behind something that it's it might be a moneymaker. And so uh, those of you who are experts in, in looking for gases in the subsurface, whether it's natural gas or helium, um, think about hydrogen and, and see if you know, the basin that you're working in might have a possibility for producing natural hydrogen. Um, you know, the going wisdom is, oh, there's no hydrogen in my basin, but, the, but it may just be no one's ever measured it before or attempted to measure it. And so I think there's gonna be a lot of interest in just doing baseline um, gas measurements from uh, deep wells that may um, penetrate the basement or other potentially hydrogen bearing formations. Um, and so uh, that could be another source of, or another place where we can use our geological understandings. Um, bringing this home to where we live here in the Midwest, the mid-continent, looking at this rift basin that's under us, that's this very deep, very thick basin filled with both basalts and uh, clastic rocks and other mafic rocks. Um, but this is a real a real hot spot for, um, again, like on the previous slide I showed drilling down here in Kansas in our rift, but also looking at how we can use this basin to store CO2 or even to store hydrogen going forward. Um, this rift, I like to say it's so big that it actually, it's so dense that it throws off GPS measurements. It throws off the satellites. And when I was working up at Iowa State, the National Geodetic Survey actually came through with their fancy gravimeters um, and did a transect across the state so that they could refine the geoid for North America and, and really give us higher quality um, Z estimates from our GPS. Um, and again, I'll just leave you with a cross section of what this rift looks like. And, and remind I want to remind us all how much space is down there, right? The Phanerozoic sedimentary rocks that we probably do a lot of our work in looking for oil and gas um, looking for drinking water. That's just this thin skin on top of this very deep, very thick basin that's filled with basalts and sandstones. Um, this is a cross section through the Kansas part of the rift, which is um, not nearly even as exciting as it, as it can get up in Iowa, uh, where we can have a much thicker basin. Um, but you can see here, you know, six miles of rock that we're not, that we're not drilling into and we're not taking advantage of. And so it's really up to the next generation of explorationists and thinkers 
to come up with ways that we can use this stratigraphy that's basically been unused uh, to date for um, both production of new resources like naturally occurring hydrogen and for storage of resources that uh, we want to get out of our surface ecosystem, things like carbon dioxide. Um, and so with that, I'll just leave us again. This current energy transition involves rethinking our relationship with work, right? CCUS and hydrogen are gonna be integral going forward. And this change is just a natural part of any industry. Don't panic. Like this is just the new cool stuff that we get to work on, right? 20 years ago, it was let's do horizontal drilling and let's frack all the shales and get our gas and our oil out of those shales, right? This is the next energy transition. This is what we can get excited about and what we'll be telling, you know, generations to come of like what we figured out and what we um, were able to build into this energy system that we have both here in the mid continents in the United States and globally. And so with that, I'll take any questions that folks have. You can put them in the chat. I don't know, um, uh, Susan, if they're able to unmute, but we do have one yeah, question. I've, I've allowed here. them to unmute so they can unmute. And so I've, I've also collated the questions Okay. So I, I guess I can start with the, yeah, go for the it. first ones. And then, but if anybody would like to, let's go get through the ones that people typed in the chat sure. and then we'll ask people to unmute. Okay, so the first one is, how do you think we should handle um, permeability parameters for CO2 leaking when it is injected in an oil depleted reservoir? What about seals for both? Well, I, I think in an oil field, we're going to have a lot of data, hopefully, about that reservoir, and we're going to be able to understand, um, you know, the cap, excuse me, the capillary nature of, and sealing nature of that cap rock that we have over uh, the reservoir. Um, the while there is always room for more research and more study and 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 more say core analysis work in understanding our seal rocks with respect to CO two. I think a lot of the data that we've already collected can be used by a skilled petrophysicist or reservoir engineer to um, make pretty good predictions about whether that seal rock in a depleted oil and gas field would uh, hold CO2. Um, and so I would say, you know, again, you have to reach out to the people that have, you know, that expertise in seal rock analysis and engineering, um, show them the data that you've got and have them make that um, educated guess based on on the physics that they understand. Um, certainly, there's so, room for for more research in that uh, realm. So interesting because it brings um, a huge new emphasis on geochemistry and what happens with the interaction of the CO2 in the seal. Yep. Well, and in the reservoir too. We're injecting oh, CO2. Yeah. That's going to create a weak acid in the reservoir. If you're injecting in a carbon carbonate formation, that is probably going to cause some dissolution. Um, exactly. One of the things I would really like to see is some, some, you know, post-injection drilling to take a core out of a reservoir that we've injected CO2 into. Um, here in Kansas, we, we did a test injection in the Wellington field in South Central Kansas. I would love to core that and see what diagenesis has happened in that reservoir under the influence of this supercritical CO2. Um, that would be amazing. We, has, it, yeah. has it only been dissolution or have we seen some precipitation of minerals that again can allow us to, you know, tell the public basically that, hey, we're injecting CO2, but you know, some of this mineralizes out. And so it 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 does it does turn into a solid form that has less chance of ri less risk of leakage or seismicity. Yeah, right. And that was so interesting about well, to do that before, for example, the sinkhole happens. <laughs> Yeah, you know, again, I, I don't know how much we we would involve. I don't know how likely having a sinkhole would be. Typically, um, you know, sinkholes happen from shallower uh, dissolution events. But mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we 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 do want to be careful with how we talk about things. And and certainly, in almost every time I bring up hydrogen, someone talks about the Hindenburg, and I say, well, that was a hundred years ago. We've been using hydrogen in our, you know, refineries, and we've got this pipeline system, and we've been storing it in caverns, and, and we haven't heard about anything like that since. So, like, we should remember that that things, you know, our ability to handle industrial things gets better over time. 
um, and and we develop. Uh, you make a really really good point. I'm, I'm yeah. glad. Yes, that's a great point. And so I, I would I would raise the point of just like don't say that there are no risks, but we need to remind people um, and help them understand where the risks from these activities fit with respect to risks they understand. You know, like. Mm -hmm we are probably a thousand times more likely to die from driving to work every day than we are from, you know, a CCUS facility or a hydrogen storage cavern. Um, uh, you know, we have a larger chance of seismicity at a rock concert than we do uh, from some of these injection schemes. And so we, we just, again, need to talk um, in, a, in a professional and accurate way and, and I think provide those analogs for people so they under, so that they can understand and decide, you know, ultimately it is, it is the decision of communities that host these facilities, whether they host them. And, and we want to give them the, all the information possible uh, to make that informed decision. It makes such a great point. And, and I think that if we had thought of these p possibilities of this approach, in the early days of, of hydraulic of shale of, of um, shale revolution and uh, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, we could mm -hmm. have potentially uh, avoided some of the negativity and and, and inflammatory th thought. Yeah, and again, I think it's it's about being you know dispassionate and neutral and 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 presenting facts and analogs that that is really where we can. We can reduce that that risk of of inflammation, right? As we all know, inflammation is one of the worst things for the human body, and so <laughs> we want to avoid that at all costs. Absolutely. Okay, so here's another question: How does the chemistry of salt affect the storage of hydrogen? Oh, that's an excellent question, and the answer to that is we don't have a lot of great answers. We're getting there. You know, hydrogen is a is a it is a reactive substance, and so when we get that into a sedimentary formation, um, we are likely to see that hydrogen react with pyrite to make H two S. We might see it react with groundwaters um, to make them slightly more acidic. We might see it react with uh, any biological material, microbiological material that's in that groundwater. Right, microbes would love to eat hydrogen. It's one of their favorite things, right? And so we really need to understand, especially if we're going to store um, hydrogen in a in a subsurface aquifer. What are the parameters? What is the chemistry that we need to be monitoring to ensure that uh, we are maintaining that system in a stable state long term? We we definitely don't want to make some you know, subsurface bioreactor that that is creating that we're not going to be able to get that hydrogen back out at high purity, and so there's going to be a ton of of need for both basic research and the applied research and the operational know-how. Um, and I should say, if folks haven't heard of the Solution Mining Research Institute, I should have plugged them here. That's a great industry organization that unites a lot of folks that run hydrogen storage caverns and and other storage caverns. And they share best practices around safety and 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 operations. I think that's one of the best parts of the group. It's also just a, a very fun uh, collegial community where you know people get together and share the, the again those best practices for safety. And there's a lot of interest in that community and how how you don't not just how you build the cavern, but how do you operate it for 50 years in a very um, stable state. Perfect. That's great. Regarding direct CO2 capture and criticism of it, any suggestions where to find discussions of cost and energy intensity reductions and or efficiency improvements? Yeah, so so for DAC or direct air capture, again, that's where we you know have an industrial facility that just runs normal air through it and captures CO2 out of that airstream. Um, there has been a lot of Department of Energy funded research that you can find um, by Googling direct air capture Department of Energy research, um, uh, going to Google Scholar, entering direct air capture research uh, would would show you a lot of those things too. And, and the DOE studies are, are nice because they also often include that economic aspect um, and, and sort of, you know, a full techno economic analysis of the systems, not just, you know, how, how does the chemistry of the system 
respond? What is the what are the engineering optimizations you need? It's well, what are the costs associated with all the stages of the process? Um, and I think that can that can again inform folks that want to take that research and and move it out into the real world and try to build something, build a system that can can bring benefits to uh, to some to some end user. Perfect. Okay, what types of geologic hydro hydrogen are there? I'm assuming they're talking about the types of traps, but I'm not sure. Types of geologic hydrogen. Yeah, so so I guess the main idea is that you would get hydrogen um, that would be coming out of natural groundwaters. Um, those groundwaters uh, often seem, the, the, the places that people seem to be exploring for natural hydrogen today are in igneous and metamorphic rocks. Maybe those are ones that are undergoing or have undergone serpentinization where some hydrogen has come out of that hydrous mineral into the groundwater. Um, again, one of the things we're lacking is just basic measurements of the hydrogen content of our groundwater, right? It's never been economic before. Um, and so you may see a well uh, where they measured the helium in it, but they didn't measure the hydrogen because, you know, why spend extra money on something you can't sell or no one cares about? Um, so again, we should see the absence of that data, not to mean that there's no hydrogen there. It's just no one measured it. And it's our jobs as 21st century geologists to go out there and measure hydrogen in all the wells that we're analyzing other gases for. And one thing to remember is um, the, the cross-section of a helium molecule is smaller than the cross-section of a hydrogen molecule. And so if we have a trap that is trapping helium, you know, if that cap rock is strong enough or, or fine, fine grained enough to, to keep helium in that reservoir, we should, you know, at least um, contemplate that there could be hydrogen trapped in there as well. Um, and we may want to add that to the, the lab analysis that we do on that headspace gas from a well that we just collected. Um, and again, getting that data out there, and hopefully we'll see geological surveys uh, implementing sort of their their bread and butter, which is surveying, you know, surveying wells in their states or in their jurisdictions um, for hydrogen content. Maybe we can understand better models of what rock types might be more productive to to search for hydrogen in, and which rock types maybe we can avoid or minimize our exploration in. Excellent. So we have time for a couple more, okay. even though we have a lot more. Yeah, what, folks are, um, are welcome to email me uh, if you have any more questions. I will put my email in the chat. So um, I'll just select one. Some of these were are kind of similar, but one's very different. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on the permitting hurdles for subsurface hydrogen or CO2 storage? Um, yeah, so the the currently to get a permit to inject CO2 for most of the country, you have to go through the Environmental Protection Agency and get what's called a class six uh, permit. And these permits take, at least historically, have taken a long time, you know, up to two years to get a permit. Um, what we're seeing is that permitting uh, authority is being devolved down to certain states. So Wyoming and North Dakota have it currently. It's called class six primacy. You can Google that term if you if you want to read more about it. A number of other states are applying for this primacy um, uh, ability. And when typically when we see that primacy devolve to the state, the permits become faster to be issued. And I think some of the North Dakota permits have taken six to seven months instead of over a year. Um, and so that permitting is being streamlined. Um, it's especially helpful when you have folks like at a cert, like at a in a state regulatory agency that might be very well versed in the local geology. And so they can get up to speed with what's being proposed faster than maybe someone at a higher um, regulatory level. With hydrogen, um, it's it's a lot less um, codified. There is no um, EPA hydrogen injection well class or permit system. It's gonna be ad hoc on a state by state basis. It's probably gonna be modeled after natural gas storage regulations if there are specific hydrogen regulations that exist. But probably what you want to do if you envision one of these projects is to reach out to your regulators and involve them as early as possible. Same thing with CO2 storage. You know, your regulators should be your friend. They shouldn't be your adversary. Um, hopefully that our regulators across the country can, can have those sort of productive technical 
relationships with the people they regulate so that everyone can understand the subsurface uh, in the most professional and accurate way possible so that no one's trying to um, you know, unduly stymie a project or unduly you know, green light a project. We all need to take the right um, dispassionate measured approach toward doing these sorts of projects because it's not gonna serve anyone's interest if there is a mistake or there is a release or there is um, unexpected seismicity, right? We want to get, we want to, we want to hit home runs every time we do these projects, uh, because certainly if if there's an incident in one of these early wells, it's going to slow the whole process, the whole industry down, and and set us back. So true. Great, great points. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're a little bit over our time commitment. We're mm -hmm. about one oh six. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hashuk for for this and just want to um, tell everybody that that we have um, the opportunity to to watch the, the recording. I'll be sending an email with a link to the recording. Also want to thank Tulsa uh, Geological Society and APG for making this possible, this this webinar that's free. And we have two sponsors. We have Commit. We also have Drill to Frack. And if, if anyone would like to be a sponsor for a future uh, webinar or webinar series, it, it would be great. And I just want to let you know too that uh, um, let you know that also I've put the entire fall series in a LinkedIn post, and I will send that as well so that you have a chance to sign up for the future ones. And finally, if you have specific questions. Um, Bronick has provided his email in the chat. So I just want to let you take a look and, and note that before we shut down. And anyway, any final thoughts? Really, really appreciate this. Yeah, again, I'll, I would just like to thank everyone for their time today. I know time is valuable. And um, I just want you to know that, that this energy transition isn't something that's happening to you. It's something that you get to participate in. And, and you should think of how can I harness what I can do to, um, to this new thing that's happening in my industry. This is where, at least for me, this is the exciting part of what we get to do. We get to do new things. It's not just how we've always done things. And there's a lot of frontier now that's been opened um, where we can get out there and make our names and make our businesses and, and make our networks um, for the next 10, 20, 30 years of this energy transition. I love it. And I just want to point out that this is one of the webinars we've been most excited about. We have some more that are coming up that kind of talk about flexibility, resilience, and the idea that, that you have your core knowledge and core skills, but then the key is to apply them to across multiple applications. Yep. Yeah. Your skills are like sharp. Hopefully you've sharpened that knife and you can use that knife to cut a cake or a steak or carrots, whatever you want to do. But if you have that sharp knife, you can you can do a lot with it. Well, thank you again. And I will be um, stopping the recording when I can see where to do so. And let's see.